I want to say good morning, good afternoon. I haven't looked at my time, 1201 it is. It's a privilege and a pleasure to be included in this worship experience. I would like to publicly thank Sister Cheryl Cox for inviting my family to participate in this special program. And to Pastor Lee Kamani, I know great things happen because of special people who are Edmonton Heights Church. And I'm glad to have been welcomed into the family. And equally, I'm honored to be welcomed into your virtual pulpit today. With the time that's ours in this season of Thanksgiving, allow me to speak words in your hearing that will inspire your godly imagination. We are family is our theme. With that in mind, I've tagged this sermon, we are family, appreciate what you've got. We are family, appreciate what you've got. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we open your word, open our minds and hearts to receive what the Spirit has to say to us today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If your Bibles were opened, somewhere in, I'm going to say Romans 9, I've already deleted half my sermon by accident, verses 6 through 9. If you had the message interpretation of the scripture, let me just go there. Uh, Romans 9, 6 through um, 13. Romans 9, 6 through 13. I'll read in your hearing. Don't suppose for a moment, though, that God's word has malfunctioned in some way or other. The problem goes back a long way. From the outset, not all Israelites of the flesh were Israelites of the spirit. It wasn't Abraham's sperm that gave identity here, but God's promise. Remember how it was put, your family will be defined by Isaac. That means that Israelite identity was never racially determined by sexual transmission, but it was God determined by promise. Remember that promise. When I come back next year at this time, Sarah will have a son. Verse 10 says, and that's not the only time. To Rebecca, also a promise was made that took priority over genetics. When she became pregnant by our one-of-a-kind ancestor, Isaac, and her babies were still innocent in the womb, incapable of good or bad, she received a special assurance from God. What, did, what God did in this case made it perfectly plain that his purpose is not a hit or miss thing, dependent on what we do or don't do but a sure thing determined by his decision, flowing steadily from his initiative. God told Rebecca, the firstborn of your twins will take second place. Later that was turned into a stark epigram. And this is what is so disturbing from this text. It says, I love Jacob, I hated Esau. There's a Bible app uh, made by YouVersion for those of you who have tablets and uh, digital instruments. Although I'm not a paid advertiser, I'd recommend it to those who want to have a Bible on their phone or tablets. It comes with short reading plans that serve as daily devotionals. If you have the app and did a search of family, one of the interesting discoveries you may stumble across is an article that lists six characteristics of a strong family. I would like to review them and then with that understanding, apply them to the Bible story just mentioned in scripture. If I were to ask you to describe what a family looks like, our responses would draw different pictures. I'm told that we speak in words, yet we hear in pictures. There are some of you who hear the term family and imagine a single family home with 
lush grass around it, where inside lives three generations of Baltimoreans. Others heard strong family and perhaps perhaps imagined a family photo hanging on a wall of a beautiful collection of people standing around seated parents. How many have ever seen those? Just raise your hands. I know you can't jump on the screen. If I could add the gospel song lyrics to that photograph that you have there in your mind, I would choose the lyrics of My Worship Is For Real. But Sean Mitchell sings this song and the lyrics go, you don't know my story, all the things that I've been through. You can't feel my pain, what I had to go through to get here. You'll never understand my praise. Don't try to figure it out because my worship is for real. I just had a head sensation right there. And then it comes along with the words, I've been through too much yes. not to worship yes. him. When we add character talk to describing the essence of family, we often see flaws and finer points that we can't separate. My family is great. Yet if you visit on the right day well, or the wrong time, well, what you see may change your opinion. It reminds me of a billboard with this quote. It had no punctuation, just the words. It said, I saw you at your worst, still think you're the best. Yes. I saw you at your worst, still think you're the best. The positive way of spinning it is to say it as if someone made the statement, you're the best. The other way to see it is to wonder if someone is questioning your authenticity, yes. asking if you still think you're the best. Mm -hmm. Regardless of how your family is, let's explore some of these stated characteristics of a strong family and see if we can leave this worship experience with some tools that strengthen our friendships and family bonds. Allow me to introduce point one this way. There's a quote directed towards men that says, if you let her know that she is priority and remind her from time to time how much you care, mm -hmm. you'll be amazed at how many problems disappear in your relationship. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm gonna just repeat that one time for the men in the back. If you let her know that she is priority well. and remind her from time to time how much you care, you'll be amazed at how many problems disappear in your relationship. If you want to know someone's priorities, check out how they spend their time and money. Strong families share a commitment. The specific commitment is making family priorities but it shows up in different ways. Think of it on my dad's side. My dad's side has a family reunion that happens the third weekend every single year in hot North Carolina. My mom's side has an annual cookout the second weekend of August in hot Pennsylvania. Once a year, we may agree, we may disagree, but I believe once a year is a small ask to connect with the majority of your family. I understand everyone may have a ways to travel or new family interests and, and costs get factored into decision makings. Even in the past Thanksgiving celebration with the coronavirus rampant, even health concerns are factored. But there is a way to connect at least once a year. In addition to being committed to making family a priority in relation to your time and money, you should be committed to upholding the values your family name represents. The Bible says in Proverbs 22 verse one, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. The Bible also teaches us in Matthew 6, 21, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Point two, strong characteristics of strong families, I should say. Point two, spend enjoyable time together. I like the second point and truly believe this to be one of my favorites. 
Strong families spend enjoyable time together. My absolute favorite pastime with my family is laughing and joking. Don't get me wrong, you've seen my belly, some of you. I love the food. Yet the stories, the wisecracks, the bloopers, etc., seem so entertaining. Close second to that is my competitive nature. I want to win Monopoly, basketball, Scrabble, Uno, you name it. But the thing about joy and spending an enjoyable time is that joy is lasting. You've heard them say happiness is just for the moment, but, but joy lasts. As we focus on making our family or our community or our church or our friendships better, we have to consider questions that may seem hard, but here's some questions to consider. Are we committed to spending time with our family? What does or will that time look like? Have we been intentional? Or does it feel forced or non-existent? Part of making an enjoyable atmosphere involves creating more interaction with less distraction. The pandemic, the social health and financial shift has led me to be in the house way more than usual. In the past 19 years of doing my job, I've stayed in hotels between 70 nights or more a year. I'm only home on the weekends many months. And when I get home, though, I can't treat my family like a distraction if I'm committed. I can come in the house with gifts, toys, vacation promises, and the like. But with the heart of my children or with the heart of my wife holds dear, it seems to be the time enjoying one another. Yes. Hebrews 10, 24 remarks, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up on meeting together as some are in the habit of doing but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Be committed to making family priority, then commit to spending enjoyable time together. Point three, practice good communication. If you were a fly on the wall or a painting on the wall or a picture on the wall in my home, you'd be able to tell if we have good communication or not. I'm not even gonna lie, it's a challenge to say the least. And please know, I'm only talking for me. I'm not speaking for anyone else. But do you ever hate being the bearer of bad news? Maybe it's me, I may be the only one. I just don't like receiving bad news and definitely not in detail. I can take the bad news. I don't need every detail to weigh me down. What I've learned is that growth involves affirming the good as well as challenging each other to grow stronger in our weak areas. My wife and I received counsel from my former pastor. He said, if you're going to discuss things you need to air out and fix, and if you get married, there will be things you need to air out and fix. Wow. I'm just letting you know. <laughs> just agree to a specific time each week where you can discuss the things you didn't like. The wisdom in that is, you're committed to discussing subjects that need to be broached. Second, it develops a trusted system for addressing concerns. We are imperfect, imperfect, imperfect. Even if I can't say it, we're imperfect. But I would rather confront issues once or twice a week, like Sunday morning after brunch or, or Wednesday evening before prayer meeting and, and yes, I give God time to speak to my flaws every Sabbath, yet I prefer sensitive topics flow that way instead of every day and every time someone notices my flaws. In contrast, I will accept affirmation every day of the week. Romans 1, 11, and 12, Paul writes, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Strong families talk, they communicate. 
And what may help some is to suggest a form of communication often overlooked. That's the act of listening. A professor from Drexel University in Philadelphia came up with an article of five types of communication. Her name is Dr. Wilcom, W-I-L-L-K-O-M-M. Dr. Wilcom suggests it's perhaps the most important type, important of the types of communication, because if we cannot listen to the person sitting across from us, we cannot effectively engage with them. Think about a negotiation. Part of the process is to assess what the opposition wants and needs. Without listening, it is impossible to assess that, which makes it difficult to achieve a win-win outcome. And for those interested in the other four types of communication she documents, I'll just run through those real quick. The second would be verbal communication that's face-to-face. -face. The next is nonverbal, which are the cues your body gives even if you're saying something different. I could be saying, yes, I love that idea, but my head will be shaken. No, that's nonverbal. The next one, written communication. That's a permanent form of communication that we hope is clear and concise and well-received. And the last one is visual communication. Images, memes, videos, et cetera. They're often used to sell products and ideas. Well, let's move on to point four. Point four is to express appreciation for each other. There's a level of family also present in friendship where you feel comfortable and safe enough to just appreciate each other. And you do it with loving words. You do it lovingly with words. If I grasp this earlier in life, I wonder how great I would be at it now. Once upon a time, let me take a sip of water and tell this brief horror story. Once upon a time, I was in a PhD program that I never finished. Our, our assignments involved reading our classmates' posts and giving feedback of their work. I wasn't ready. I was so discouraged by even having to. You didn't have to respond to everyone, just a few. But I thought to myself, I don't know them. And I don't really know how to pay compliments well. Couple those doubts with the fact that I could obviously see some of my classmates did it so well. I picked that up from the well-received feedback that I got. But I share this story just to say encouragement goes a long way. First Thessalonians 5.11 inspires us to encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. Have you told your family members how much they mean lately? Have you pointed out the unique ways God has designed them that bring glory to his name? Today should be the day you tell them. Let's move to point five. Strong families are able to solve problems and react well in crisis. The other day, the top boss at my job dropped a gem on us. He remarked, worry is the conversation you have with yourself about things that you cannot change. Prayer is the conversation you have with God about the things that he can change. All right. The article on the characteristics of a strong family reiterate that only Jesus was perfect. Everyone else leads to conflict, drama, struggles, arguing, etc. Conflict has its challenges and often leads to uneasy or difficult conversations. Jesus, however, is the perfect example of how to reconcile distant family. His is the mindset we need to imitate. The mercy and grace God has shown us should be the catalyst for us patiently working through pain and hurt. The victories he exhibited should give us the confidence that through Christ, all things are possible. Perhaps there is a conflict you need to step into. You might need to graciously communicate hurt 
others have caused you. Yeah, you may have to speak up for yourself. Or you may need to acknowledge how you've hurt others and ask them for forgiveness. Before you speak with others, though, communicate with God about it. Allow him to work out the details. You just tell him how you feel, what you want, and ask him to work it out to his name's honor and glory. I think about Colossians 3 and th 3 verses 13 and 14, and it may be a familiar yet hard concept even for Christians. The Bible says, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. Colossians 3 speaks about the characteristics of the old man and the new identity and traits of the new man. If you're a Christian, you can really identify with that. The things you used to do, how you used to think, how you used to react, and then it contracts, contrasts it with the way you are when you receive Jesus and have his love in your heart. If you're going to unify, there must be love, and love comes from God. Point six, strong families believe, or strong families have a shared spiritual life. That's the point. But strong families believe that an individual faith, born from collective demonstration of faith, is important. We model what we believe. In other words, there should be a display of faith in God that allows an individual to grasp the importance of spiritual disciplines. Now, what are spiritual disciplines? Spiritual disciplines are reading your Bible, praying together, and singing worship songs together. We sharpen each other in this regard. But I'm so glad we have a friend in Jesus. Even if I were alone, with God, I always have help. Yeah. Ecclesiastes 4, 9, and 10 suggests two are better than one yeah. because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Let me just recap the six characteristics of a strong family. Number one, they share a commitment to family. Two, they spend enjoyable time together. Three, they practice good communication. Four, they express appreciation or affection for one another. Five, they're able to solve problems and react well in a crisis. And six, they have a shared spiritual value. I'm sorry, a shared spiritual life. With those in mind, let's dive into the lives of one of the most drama-filled families mentioned in the Bible and make some applications. Perhaps you've heard of the blessing of Abraham, or maybe you've heard Elder Betty pray to God one of those prayers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. Has Elder Betty ever prayed that? I believe I heard him say that once before. Well, we just want to park in Genesis 25 through 27 for a few minutes as we focus on the warning against refusing God. If your Bibles were open to Hebrews 12, though, 14 through 7, the Bible writer encourages and, and warns us this way. Hebrews 12, 14 through 17 says, make every effort to live in peace with the one, I'm sorry, with everyone, and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. The story of Isaac and Rebecca's family of four is a long story, well worth the read though. 
I'm just going to hit points related to our discussion today. The Bible explains that at age 40, Isaac met, committed to, then married this fine, kind, cheerful, and considerate virgin named Rebecca. He loved him some Rebecca now. That love wasn't producing any children for them though. Isaac's commitment to his family is highlighted in Genesis 25 verse 21, where it is recorded that he pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea and Rebecca, his wife conceived. I guess steps one and two of a, a, a strong family can get checked off. There was commitment, and they must have been spending some enjoyable time yeah. together. Yeah. I say that because it took her 20 years to have children. I can see them testifying that God was so good to them because she was pregnant. In life, though, joy and pain sometimes are a package deal. The Bible says the children struggled together within her. And she said, if all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. I have to say, I'm loving this family example. The husband got a prayer through. The wife then goes through some troubling pains. And instead of getting upset, she seeks God for answers. If you're going to understand how good communication works, it's, it's just that. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Don't just pray about what you want. Pray about how to live before God yes. when you get it. Yes. Genesis 25, 23 shows us that God responded to Rebecca. Two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. She didn't run to the hospital and get an ultrasound or anything like that. God spoke to her, and when it was time, the Bible says, indeed, yes. there were twins in her womb, mm -hmm. two boys. First, there was Esau, and then a close second was Jacob, who was holding Esau's hill at birth. The Bible says the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob was a mild man. The Bible says he was a complete man, dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. Some see just the picture of a family tree. But how many know God looks at the heart? Yeah, yeah. Conflict was present and progressive. There was conflict in the womb then conflict resulting in the different professions and dispositions of her sons. There was also conflict in the opposing preferences of the parents. The Bible commentary states, as the two boys grew up, a great difference in character became evident. <clears throat> Excuse me. Esau displayed a rough, capricious, I, I found out that's moody disposition and reveled in the wild, adventurous life of field and forest. Jacob, on the other hand, had an amiable, pious, and cultured personality. The duties and responsibilities of settled family life, so monotonous and irritating to Esau, came naturally to Jacob, a plain man dwelling in tents. Whereas Esau never outgrew the physical and emotional restlessness of adolescence, Jacob developed the stability of character and soundness of judgment that should come with maturity. Isaac's love for Esau was blind partiality for his firstborn. Irrespective 
of the son's character qualifications for family leadership, and it brought division in the family. I'm sharing more understanding from the Bible commentary. And I quote, as a result, wrong, misery, and injustice marked relations between the brothers and their posterity for centuries. Isaac's preference for Esau seems to have been based in part at least on his love for venison or deer meat. Isaac shows us that to prefer one child above another inevitably, inevitably creates jealousy, division, bitterness, and misery. It's hard to appreciate or show affection when your heart's not in it. Can I, can I get a witness? Yeah, Just one yeah, witness. Yeah. When you're jealous, you, you, you shut down the love. When you're bitter, you yeah. put up the walls. And when you, have to dis, when you have to settle disputes, it's so much harder when there is little or no trust. This family was dealing with a lot of conflict centering around how God wanted to use them to fulfill his promise. Isaac was rich. Some say more money, more problems, right? Isaac was rich, as the Bible says, and he kept prospering until he was labeled wealthy. In addition to being wealthy from the blessings of God, he was powerful. He was once asked to move out of the community by Abimelech because he had become mightier than them. There was this one problem. Isaac knew God's plan as revealed to his wife, yet he wanted to do things his way. So Isaac, who was committed to his family, who spent enjoyable time with his wife and eating meat caught by his favorite son, failed to communicate that faith in God and obedience to him was of utmost importance. But little did he know how much of a failure it would be to his son. You know the story. Earlier in life, Jacob sold Esau some bread, stew of lentils, and something to drink in exchange for Esau's birthright. <laughs> his dad was so rich. I guess money meant little to him. I don't know. He, he just came from the field. He was weary. The Bible said he was tired, was weary. I know I've been hungry like that before. But um, he was willing to forfeit his future for something that could simply satisfy him in the moment. And I think there is just some time that we should just pause and say, all of us have been like that. At some point in time, if you're honest, if, if you need the Holy Spirit to remind you, you can ask him, but all of us have been like that. We have two choices to make. Are we going to throw it all on today? Or are we going to live to where we can enjoy things as well in the years to come? Well, when their father was old and blind, he suddenly thought he would soon die, just like his son when he thought he was dying. Isaac called Esau in privately and told him to prefer prepare him some good food. He actually said, go out to the field and find me something good, cook it and bring it back. And afterwards, I'll give you the blessing. Well, his plan was intercepted by his wife who was eavesdropping, or as they say, ear hustling nearby. She put Jacob up to tricking his dad. Isaac really tried to make sure he wasn't being deceived. And if you read the story, you'll find he asked who, who was talking to him. He asked how he finished so fast. Then he tried to, to, to say, come give me a kiss so he could smell if it was really his son from the field or not. Isaac was trying to use all four of his remaining senses to make sure that the blessing didn't go to anyone but Esau. His hearing, his tasting, his touching, his smell. He put everything he had into getting things his way. Yeah. His wife was trying to make sure it didn't go to Esau. And her plan worked, as you know. When Esau found out, though, he cried and became angry. Isaac was upset, too. 
But reality hit him that ultimately God's plan is the only one that's going to work. Esau begged, he cried, he begged for a blessing. He's like, Dad, don't you have a blessing? You got another blessing? So Isaac spoke to how his future would be. It wasn't as glorious a prediction, which angered Esau even more. And Esau vowed to wait until his dad's death and then kill his brother. Word got back to his mom and she made another plan. This time she worked with Isaac and that ultimately sent Jacob away um, to marry one of her, her brother's um, children. Isaac ended up living, I believe, another 43 years. I think he was 180 when he died. After many years, Jacob was returning home and planning to see his brother. And I guess this is where we see why God said, Jacob, I have loved, but Esau, I've hated. Genesis 35, one to three shows us that on Jacob's return to Bethel, God spoke to Jacob. And after he spoke to Jacob, Jacob turned around and testified to his family of a time when God answered his prayer in the day of his distress. And God had been with him in the way that he had gone. And I'm just so glad I've had some of those prayers where God answered my prayer in my distress. And it didn't matter which way I took. Well, it really does matter. It did matter then. It still matters, even though I have a testimony that God was with me every step yes. of the way. Amen. Jacob was concerned about things being settled with his family. And I want to bring it home this way. He wanted to, he was concerned about things in his family. He hadn't spoken to his brother in so long. Last he knew his brother wanted to kill him and some would suggest for good reason. So what he, Jacob did in Genesis 32, nine and 12, he prayed a prayer that God would work everything out. They ultimately met up and Jacob was trying to give him so much but Esau was very rich himself already. So he had everything he wanted. But this is what I couldn't find. The Bible never records Esau ever having a connection with God. I'm told that the righteous has never been forsaken nor a seed begging right, bread. Right. He was living off the blessings yes. God had provided for his faith parents. Yes. But even in a home where he saw his father prayed and God answered him, in a home where he saw his mother prayed and God answered her and spoke to her, in a family where he saw his brother pray and, and just came back saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Esau was just happy with everything that he had made. God is always with us, but we are not always with God. When the spirit of the Lord spoke to Jacob, he prayed about resolving the conflict. Today, we need to turn back to God and pray about our salvation as well as our family reconciliation. Esau had the same opportunity to choose God. But even though it appears he set his heart on the other things instead of God, let me say that again. It appears he set his heart on other things instead of God. Jacob, however, still had to honor the God who had always been with him and answered his prayer by going to his brother and asking him for forgiveness. I dare say if you have time and you want to study this this week, that you pick up the Bible and study Ephesians 1. I'm just going to read 13 and 14 in your hearing, and I'll just end with a short appeal. It says, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those 
who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. I want to let someone know, you may not know, God the Father chose you like Jacob before yes. you were even born. Christ died for your sins and mine, and the Holy Spirit seals us and guarantees our spiritual inheritance. I hope that you can find yourself in this story. Three points, Father, God the Father initiated our salvation, the Son accomplished it, and the Holy Spirit makes it real in our lives. Yes. Today, someone has realized that God is at work in your life and was committed way before you even had a chance to sin or even do something good. The Holy Spirit is moving you to understand that what he requires is that you first commit to making him priority. Two, get to spending enjoyable, enjoyable time with him as he has asked. Three, communicate with God in the good times and the bad. Four, go ahead and praise him for who he is and what he's done. Then five, all those problems, cast all your cares on God because he cares for you and allow him to work out everything for your good, but for his glory. If that's you, if you felt the Lord, the Holy Spirit speaking to you today, and you're willing to say, God, I commit to you. I want things your way. I recognize where I've erred but I also recognize that you've been with me all the way. If that's you, I just ask that you in the privacy of your home or wherever you're viewing this service from, just as an act of worship today, just raise your hand. I just wanna pray for you and with you that God, the one who started this good work in you will be able to complete it until the coming of Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another chance to get it right. And by getting it right, <laughs> we simply mean giving everything to you to work out to your name's honor and glory. God, whatever we do, whether we eat or drink, or whatever we do, God, may we only do it to your name's honor and glory. You've provided everything for us, but most importantly, God, you chose us. You offered us salvation and you've given us the Holy Spirit to guarantee our spiritual inheritance. Today, we wanna take advantage of your free gift that you gave with love. And I pray for everyone who's taken the personal act of worship a step further by saying, it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer that you will work out any issues they may have with their friends or family. God, we come to you in love, faith, and trust, knowing that you will do it. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and have a wonderful Sabbath day.